Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome to the round edi round uh, table edition for April 2015. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm managing partner and uh, of Manifest Investing, and one of your co-hosts for the evening. I'm joined here by Ken Cavola, Cy Lynch, and Hugh McManus. All of us are friends in investing, and we've been doing this for a while. Uh, investing in uh, the long-term approach for now a couple of decades for some of us, maybe an extra decade for one or two of us, but in any event, for quite some time. And uh, we like to hang out and provide educational demonstrations and, and discussions for all of you. Um, so again, welcome to the session. Uh, the four companies that we'll be presenting tonight are, the logos are there on your screen, NIC, which is ticker symbol EGOV, T. Rowe Price, the butterfly is for a caterpillar, we'll let Hugh explain that later, and then Iconics. So let's kind of go ahead and just dig in here. This is our standing agenda. Uh, and again, welcome to everybody, those of you that are returning, that have been here for these sessions. They've been going on monthly for almost five years now. And an extra big welcome if you're joining us for the first time. Again, we keep this rather informal. We will field questions during the session, and there is a Q&A session after about the first hour or so. We generally go about uh, approximately 70 minutes with the session and then we, we stick around for a Q&A session. We'll talk about results and what we're trying to do. Um, quick look at the portfolio. We'll have Ken do the report card approach when we get to the portfolio checkup. The four stocks that you see there are the stocks that will be reviewed. Uh, we do have a poll at the end where you have an opportunity to vote for any of them or none of them. And uh, this is pretty much what we do every month. Let's take care of the, the legal paperwork first. Quite simply, no investment recommendation is intended. We do talk about real stocks in real time. We do this for education and illustration, demonstration, all powerful stuff. And uh, we think the best way to learn is when you can actually relate to some of the stuff being kicked around. Uh, the ideas that we bring are real ideas that we have at the current time, and we do keep track. If you or anyone you know would like to be reminded about future sessions, you can write to Ken's spouse, nkabula1 at comcast.net, and, and Natalie will take care of you. She sends a couple of reminders every month just to make sure that you're uh, kept up to speed. We have these sessions near the end of every month. They're usually on Tuesday nights, but we do some Thursdays, and we do some Saturday mornings. And again, if you have any questions, you can forward them either to Natalie or to myself. They're my email address, Mark R at manifestinvesting. Com. This is what it's all about. Again, we've been doing this about five years now. Every month we come together and we kind of kick around our one of our favorite investment opportunities at the time. We are willing to consider less traditional non-core selections, but we try to keep them to a minimum. We do want to build a tracking portfolio that outperforms the market by five percentage points over the long term. And we really like to see roughly three or almost uh, – four out of five selections outperforming the market, we'd be happy to see three out of five over the longer term. This is a kind of an update. This slide shows you where we're at on a month-by-month -month basis, uh, comparing our relative return. That's kind of our report card. And again, relative return is taking the internal rate of return of our tracking portfolio and comparing it or subtracting out the Wilshire 5000. So anything above zero would be outperforming the total stock market. You can see we have been hovering slightly above zero. And again, over the long term, that objective is to get somewhere up around that red line, hopefully even beating the red line uh, over the longer term. But again, somewhere between that zero to 5% range would be our target. The overall trend's been pretty good. Um, we're not quite at that three out of five stocks that we picked outperforming the market, but that's actually up from what it's been. Uh, right now, 51.6% of the selections we've made have actually beaten the market since they were selected. Here's a quick look at the most uh, frequently selected, the most influential positions in the tracking portfolio. This is actually a manifest investing dashboard of some of the more um, important characteristics, in our opinion, of all the stocks that we, that we follow. And in the case of Cognizant there, you can see the 11 in parentheses. The 11 refers to the number of times that the, the Cognizant has been selected. In other words, the number of decisions. 
So anytime it's selected by any one of the four of us, a guest damsel, a guest knight, or the audience, we will actually take and invest $1,000 into uh, the selection that is made. In the case of Cognizant, then 11 times 1,000 means that $11,000 has been invested in Cognizant. That is now worth over $17,000. And we actually have to restrain uh, Reverend Lynch from picking it because he's always interested in Cognizant, especially under uh, return forecast conditions up in the upper teens, and it's a very high-quality company. So we, we kind of have to hold him back. I think he's made uh, seven of those 11 selections. And uh, that's actually working out pretty well for him. Uh, the second uh, best performing one is Apple. Six selections now at nearly $12,000. Um, pretty good stuff from Apple. And you can just kind of walk your way down the list. Any comments on any of those that we uh, can dwell on or point the audience to? It's hard to resist those 100 qualities with high pars, Mark. It is. I don't and of course, Apple's been there some too. It's a little out of the green right now, but it's sitting there with that hundred as well. Yeah, it's had a pretty good run. And and just to point out the exception that always proves the rule, Mark, uh, OLED Universal Display uh, for a 54 quality stock seems to be doing fairly well <laughs> with our our two picks. So that's. Yes, it is. Yeah, the two picks in that Apparently, Microsoft is a glamour company again. Yeah, and I, I think um, people were holding their nose when you were picking that one uh, a few years ago, Mr. McManus. Well, I think more than – I'm not the only one that picked it, but uh, I'm kind of surprised people are saying nice things about the company. Yeah, it's back. I mean, it, it did languish for quite a while. The stock price yeah. languished, and that made people a little bit impatient, but – it's actually making things that people want. Yeah, and I'm looking at Windows. And I, I believe all four of us selected Cisco at some point in time mm -hmm. and, took, and took some heat mm -hmm. for doing it. And look at that number. Again, uh, over the long term, and I mean, you go back to that previous slide, over the long term, the, the trend is in the right direction, and I think uh, bearing itself out pretty well. We are out there seeking exceptional performance and seeing it from a number of companies. Now, you can look at not just all the winners. There's a few companies that haven't worked out quite so well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a public link up at the top. If you type in that entire link up at the top, you do not have to be a, a Manifest Investing subscriber. You can follow along. Um, we actually list the number of times that the stocks are selected and uh, keep pretty tight control of that over time so you can actually watch that, uh, watch the tracking portfolio real time. All right, Ken, I think we'll uh, go ahead and let you do your uh, your teacher's perspective on the portfolio. I've given you the report card and just a little bit on the sector diversification. Why don't you go ahead and talk us through the condition of the tracking portfolio? Well, I, I was talking uh, before we started about seeing a, a stage show last night uh, uh, about a group of nuns, and at one point they brought out the magic ruler and had a lot of fun with it. Uh, talking about wrapping knuckles and mm. doing all kinds of things during uh, the old-style Catholic schools. But I'm not sure we shouldn't be wrapping some knuckles on those of us that are going to pick some more technology for this portfolio. <laughs> We're about 40% into tech stocks in the portfolio, and um, uh, I guess that that's where the opportunity lies a lot of times. Uh, right now, our par is a little bit uh, beneath where the sweet spot is. And because it's a little bit beneath where the sweet spot is, uh, I would be looking to, to do some things in the next couple of months uh, to maybe adjust uh, our portfolio to bring that par back into the, the sweet spot. And, and obviously the way you do it is twofold. If you're adding new money, you buy stocks that are at the high end. Uh, but if you're already holding stocks that have a low potential annualized return, uh, then you're, you sell them out of your portfolio at the same time. Uh, so we, we might be looking at the very bottom at the stocks with the lowest pars uh, and seeing what there is to uh, talk about there. I also would remark that our growth is a little bit on the anemic side. Uh, I like to see growth in these portfolios if they're going to to stay in the sweet spot. I like to see the growth number up closer to 12%. 
Uh, now this is sales growth, uh, not earnings growth, uh, and it's uh, it's a little bit uh, anemic uh, right now. Uh, I think that if you've been watching earnings season uh, at all uh, in the last uh, oh, month or so, you've noticed company after company after company beat on the bottom line. Uh, that's the earnings uh, that they present to the public and that they compare against what the analysts think. Uh, but there's been a heck of a lot of misses on the top line where companies are coming in just a little bit short as far as revenue is concerned. Uh, that means that there's a lot of stock buybacks in play and there's a lot of other ways that the company can turn anemic revenue growth into uh, fairly average or even above average earnings growth. Uh, but I'd like to see that revenue back up around 12 for our portfolio. So uh, maybe we should send the message out to all the, the gentlemen that are picking stocks right now to let's, uh, let's remind ourselves that we are trying to buy growth companies and let's look for some companies that have uh, growth up around that area of 12% uh, or better. Uh, at least in our opinion, that's where it's going to be. I think the rest of our numbers are in pretty decent shape, uh, but because we have a low par and because our growth is a little bit low, we might want to look at the bottom. Uh, even tonight, we might want to look at the bottom stocks. I don't know if you prepared a slide for that or not, Mark. I didn't, but we can actually do that. What, what you'll see, we can jump out and do that, is a, a fair number of stocks that are... Um, in that 3%, 4% range. I'm just going to go over to Manifest Investing, my favorite website, and take a look at, right, right from the home page, you could actually click on the public link for the roundtable. That'll be good for our purposes. And this shows you what that will look like. And what Ken is actually requesting us to do is let's go ahead and take a look at the companies. You can see the report card is right over here to your right. Um, I'm going to reverse sort it so we can see some of the companies that may come into question. That's one of the reasons I didn't bring anything automatic here tonight. A couple of those are special situations and everything else is kind of in that uh, you know, four or five percent range. And again, if it's a pretty good company, that, that's not a company I'm in a, in a hurry to jettison. Do you see anything there that's, that jumps off the page at, at any of you? Well, I you know I understand that uh, why Amazon and and Staples are both in the portfolio. They're uh, they've been added uh, uh, with a, a slightly different uh, view as to uh, what we're going to do to build a long-term portfolio. I, uh, Hugh looks at the bottom. He looks for stocks that are really on sale, and then he wants to hold them for an especially long time. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, if the staple story is still in place, if we're still expecting there to be a single office product store uh, when uh, everything, um, you know, irons out, or whether the Office Max Office Depot is going to provide uh, significant competition to be able to make it out, make it on its own. Um, maybe maybe the jury's out on that yet. I know Global Payments was a choice that I made a long time ago. I think it's probably only been chosen once. Uh, I know that SEIC Investments was a choice I made a long time ago, and it's only been uh, chosen probably once. Uh, so those might be opportunities right there to uh, to unload a little bit of low par stocks uh, and look for a slightly higher power. Uh, power stocks. Uh, frankly, Mark, I'd, I'd want to look at it for a month before I made a final recommendation, however. Yeah, and Hugh, as your thinking changed at all, I mean, the Staples selection has actually worked out quite well. I think your average cost is down around $10. Yeah, um, but I, I'm still keen to hold on to it for a while longer, you know. Yeah. Anne is asking, what does Mark mean when he says special situations? And, and I think we're discussing one of those right now, Anne, that, that uh, one of the reasons Staples was added to the portfolio was, was a thesis that that, that uh, was going to kind of shake down into a single company. And uh, Hugh had the thinking that Staples was probably the strongest of the three companies that were uh, existing at the time we we bought, uh, we took these, I don't know, we've probably taken, what, Mark, five or six, 
maybe even seven uh, positions in Staples. Do you know for certain? Yeah, it's at least five. Five? It's actually seven. Yeah, so seven, seven times. Okay. So $7,000 okay. invested in Staples is now worth about ten. Okay. But that's and what, what Mark means by special situation. Sometimes uh, we'll make an addition to the portfolio based on a, a, a certain thesis. If you remember, uh, we were looking at, at some stocks like OLED and like uh, DDD, uh, both high-tech stocks that, that might in fact be stocks that have really messed with traditional ideas of manufacturing or traditional ideas of, of how objects were going to work. Uh, and in those situations, uh, we, we bought and we had the intention to hold for a reasonable period of time until the industry began to become noticed and, and matured a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and as, Go and ahead. as following up, Mark, with a question, would it be a good situation to show how you can do a worksheet in what would happen if you sell? Uh, uh, you can always do a worksheet on a dashboard. The, the problem with this dashboard is it's so long that uh, it, there's a, it involves a heck of a lot of scrolling to, to mm. show the kind of things <coughs> we're talking about. Mark, you were saying something. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, really what it boils down to is in the case of Amazon as another example, well, what, what Hugh is basically saying is the picture that's represented here by the analysts does not really represent the, the future of Amazon. And the way I've always boiled that down is, is Amazon can basically make their earnings whatever they want to. So therefore, earnings and PEs don't really make sense at this point in their life cycle. Now, I think that makes some of the people in the audience it probably makes your skin crawl. I mean, I know people that actually get angry about, about this, but Amazon right now is a company that's running on cash flow, and they, they manage the cash flow. So we actually did a workshop on Amazon where you really should be looking at Amazon from a cash flow basis because, again, Jeff Bezos basically has said, what, what do you want their earnings to be? He can make them whatever you want them to be. Well, Mark, doesn't it probably, and Hugh, you, you picked Amazon, Hugh, but uh, shouldn't we really be putting Amazon in the same list that we put uh, OLED or put 3D uh, printing? Uh, basically, it's disruptive technology. It's mm -hmm. out to change the way the world works. Yes, that's right. And it's, it's, a, it's a company that's driven by acquiring market share because it believes that once it does that, it's a way to shut down competitors. Its real profitability is not likely to occur for another five plus years. Kay is I'm asking. I'm curious about uh, global payments because uh, I picked that once, Ken, and um, it has about doubled since I picked it. So I'm wondering what that um, that the number doesn't look right. Well, maybe I'm uh, thinking of. Uh, Unless we've sold it at some point, and I don't remember doing that. I don't think we did. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I will run, I'll present case studies next month on Global Payments, SEI, and uh, maybe even Roche. Although, you, Although again, Global Payments, uh, if, if I'm right that it's run up so much, it, it'd be nice to take take some some profit. But uh, again, we're, you know, we... we what this this uh, the round table is a bit of a a hybrid situation we really stress you know the current best picks and model are running this as a tracking portfolio rather than a managed portfolio because we don't reinvest our our sales and that sort of thing um but th that said, I know, Ken, you look at, and you were mentioning tonight that our par and our gross a little on the low side, and if this were a managed portfolio, we would want to be boosting it. And, uh, you know, I understand the Staples and the Amazon and, and those special situations, but, you know, global payments and probably Roche, although it's getting a little higher at four, you know, I, I mean, if you need to start boosting the, the par and the, the growth, those are the companies that we should be looking at selling. Right. And, and Cy, I might be confusing global payments with world acceptance uh, that uh, I, maybe I didn't choose global payments. It might have been world acceptance that I, I put into here. I, I think but, that's uh, right. We'll actually but, show, the, we'll show the decision made. I'm pretty sure Cy picked it. It has gone from 43 at one point last year to 86 now. 
So I mean, that's that's uh, how powerful. Well, it's, not, it's at 100 now. So yeah, it's at 100 nice now. And, and we and we wonder why we we all haven't <laughs> picked it at that point. <laughs> well, uh, Mark K is. Back. Mark K is asking uh, if that growth column is referring to EPS growth. It's always top line growth. It's either sales, and in the cases of some financials, it's book value growth. So it's it's sales growth for most companies. And that is the number K that we're we'd like to push up just a little bit. Uh, right now, the aggregate uh, growth number is around 10 percent, and we'd like to push it up to. Uh, maybe 11 and a half, 12 percent, if we could, and you'll you'll notice these companies at the bottom of the par list here. You'll notice that they have fairly low growth for the most part to go right along with it. Uh, I mean, Amazon is obviously the exception to the rule, but you have to go way down to U.S. physical therapy to even get back to. Uh, about average in the portfolio, and there's a lot of them that are down in the ones, twos, three percent growth near the bottom of this list here. Absolutely. So I'll go ahead and put put together case studies on those uh, those three. Although I consider Roche a member of my family, so you guys may have to <laughs> try that one away from me. So I'll go ahead and set that up for next month. Okay. Mark, I'm going to let you just click through the slides. There's no sense in running over to my machine because I've put everything onto a slide. Uh, and we're going to look at a company called NIC Incorporated, uh, but the company very rarely goes by its company name. It refers to itself in almost everything that it does. Even its company website is egov.com. So that's its ticker, egov, E-G-O-V, and you can see that uh, if I've been searching for the old standard up, straight, and parallel, uh, that's what I usually invest in, and that's what I try to find, and that's what I found for you this evening. Uh, I think I brought this one to the roundtable back in 2012, and it's matched the market fairly well. Uh, since 2012, but uh, I think it's a, a place right now where you might want to take a look at it again. Fairly small company. Let's talk about what it does real quickly. Uh, here's its, mis uh, its mission statement. Uh, basically, eGov sets up portals uh, in state and the federal government uh, with the people that need to talk with the state or the federal government. Uh, the, the first entry that eGov has in almost any state that it enters is the Bureau of Driver's License, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. And eGov sets up a way where people can uh, renew their motor vehicle uh, license, uh, take their test for a chauffeur's license, uh, check their uh, standing as far as how many points they might have on their license uh, and do a number of different things electronically. Uh, that's the, the first portal that eGov normally sets up. If you'd click, Mark. Uh, basically, its purpose uh, is to communicate with the uh, citizens, uh, and they want to make this communication available 24 hours a day. So this is company propaganda, but it's from a, a very well thought out, very well prepared uh, presentation right on their website uh, that if you want to uh, explore it at length, uh, there's all kinds of links within the presentation to other presentations that that define different things and, and walk you through the practices of this company. Uh, as you would expect, the company deals day in, day out with setting up portals. So they've set up a, a pretty attractive portal themselves uh, to explain what their company does and, and how it makes money. If you click again, Mark. Uh, the the company operates on a, on a fairly unique uh, model for its business. It's self-funded, and self-funding works uh, if you follow through these six steps, and I'll let you read them while I try to explain them in the, in the long term. Self-funding works by eGov setting up the first portal 
uh, within the state uh, when it first moves into a particular state. Right now, eGov is in about half of the states. Uh, it has partnerships with various government agencies and a few other uh, of the states, and it also has some partnerships uh, right now, just a few minor partnerships with the federal government. Uh, but basically what it does when it sets up its first portal, portal is it takes a small fee uh, for the service, whatever it is, and as it adds services to the state, uh, it takes these efficiency fees from a limited number of the services that it offers. Uh, these fees cover the cost of the initial portal, uh, it covers the cost of maintaining the Porsche portal, and then most importantly, it covers the cost of expanding the services to the state at basically no cost to the governmental unit. It's all paid for by these small fees, and the fees are not attached to every single service, but just to a limited number of service, and they're deliberately kept low at, a, at $1 to $3. Uh, those fees create a long-term funding stream uh, which supports the e-government uh, growth. Uh, funding from this small number of fees uh, supports expansion, and then uh, basically when the portal expands, when uh, customers are able to do many more things than just uh, deal with their driver's license, for example, uh, two-thirds to three-quarters of the services come to the users at no cost uh, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the ongoing funding source also helps it build new services, completely new services within the state, sometimes department-to-department department service, sometimes business-to-government services, but different types of services that the state didn't even know uh, it could create uh, prior to NIC coming into the state. Uh, since the NIC uh, portal is the only paid, is only being paid uh, when the services are being used, then there's a built-in incentive uh, from both ends to uh, to make the the uh, operation as smooth as possible, as painless as possible, and to keep the customers coming back so that revenues can be raised, so that expansion can go on, and so that the cycle can continue uninterrupted. Mark, if you'd click uh, again, uh, here's the 26 states in back blue that are right now full state partners. Now each state is different. Uh, if you go to this website that I referred you to, it's egov.com. Uh, and if you look at the investor presentation, uh, you're able to go to any of these 26 states that are fully committed to the NIC portal and you're able to see what services are currently being offered and what services are in the planning stages. In addition, states with dots uh, have certain of their agencies in partnership. Uh, in addition to the entire state, there are certain agencies that are, are participating with NIC, and uh, sometimes there's uh, complete private partnerships that are uh, uh, part of the entire system uh, giving information to the uh, citizens of the particular state. Click again, Mark, if you would. Uh, NIC has been one of the first to move into mobile services, and right now it's the largest provider of mobile services uh, of anybody in the entire country as far as government portals uh, are concerned. It was interesting to me that over 30 percent uh, of households that make more than twenty thousand uh, dollars communicate uh, almost entirely on the internet through their phones, uh, through these mobile uh, services. It's the fastest growing segment of communication that we have right now and eGov is number one uh, and plans to maintain that that hold on, on these uh, portals that can be accessed through your telephone. Click again, Mark. Uh, you can see the breakdown right now. The, the largest percentage of, of 
income is coming from interactive government services, excluding driver history. Uh, when you add driver history to it, that's the orange section of the pie on your right, you'll see that we have a, 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 a huge percentage, uh, almost, <laughs> excuse me folks, Bless I you. apologize for that. You see a huge percentage of, of EGOV's uh, revenues are coming from interactive government services. They break out driver history because that's the largest segment of services that they offer. They also have small segments that are a uh, fixed fee uh, that give them recurring income in the states of Delaware and Indiana, and they also have some time and materials projects uh, that are essentially one-time affairs uh, that happen for a flat fee and then don't necessarily recur. On the left-hand side, you can see that the expenses start from the time they open the portal uh, in a particular state, and uh, typically about six months into opening the portal, it becomes profitable, and again, the profits are coming from uh, these uh, fees that are being charged for various services. Uh, let's click again, Mark. Uh, they plan to grow by adding more services for the states they already hold contracts with. Uh, they opened more than 500 new services in the 26 states uh, that they covered in 2014. Their goal is to continue to add states at the rate of two per year. So with 24 states, that takes care of the next 12 years at least. And uh, they also plan to increase their presence at the federal level, and that's an almost unlimited source of, of ways to deal with the general public uh, in these uh, portals, uh, especially through mobile devices. Click again, Mark. Uh, here's the Eagle for uh, this company. You can see it's a very high quality company at 91, and it has a pretty decent par at 11.6%. Uh, Mark is anticipating sales, and remember Mark's numbers are, are consensus numbers coming from a, a number of different analysts, and the analysts uh, feel that growth is going to be around 12%. Uh, with a consensus PE value somewhere in the neighborhood of 31. That's an average PE. If you click again, Mark, this is my SSG on the company. Uh, there's those up straight and parallel lines. Uh, I've, I'm anticipating growth in earnings at about 15%. Uh, that's uh, a little bit lower than the company is anticipating. The company has indicated that they anticipate growth at 18% out to 2020. So at 15, I, I feel that, that I'm uh, being a little bit on the conservative side. It's a little bit less than Value Line anticipates. Uh, Value Line says that they can see the growth here maybe at, uh, at a little bit more than 15%, but not much more. Uh, I'm looking at, at uh, pretty decent margins. Uh, you notice that gross margin goals uh, were set at 40% for the company, uh, so they anticipate margins to continue to expand as they move forward. Uh, great return on equity numbers. When there isn't any debt, uh, that return on equity number can be seen as, as a possible sustainable growth rate. Uh, I certainly don't think I'm going to see this company grow at 40, uh, but again, when I say 15, I think I'm being reasonably conservative in setting up my SSG. One more click, Mark. I've uh, judged going into the future that PEs will, will maybe contract a little bit from current levels and move back to levels that they were, were showing in 2010. Uh, so I've set them at 35 and 20. Uh, the current PE is at just a little bit under 29. Uh, so I'm certainly in that range at the moment. Uh, the average PE for the last five years has been uh, closer to 34. 
so I, I don't think that I'm doing too much contraction, but I do anticipate that these PEs will move down uh, as the company uh, continues to grow. I'm seeing this as a buy right now, and my par, one more click mark if you would, my par value is about a little bit under 14%. That compares very favorably with Mark's par at about 11.5%. Uh, I've put Mark's uh, Chronicle at the bottom of this slide right here. I love to, to buy stocks where I see the quality rating uh, just, uh, you know, on a nice, steady, upward trajectory. And that's certainly what I'm seeing from NIC. NIC. Uh, I would have loved to have bought this company back maybe at, uh, you know, uh, a couple, maybe April of last year when the par value was, was way at that peak up there historically. Well, that's way, way back. I was thinking of the peak in 2014, but I think that it's at a pretty reasonable par right now to give me enough room to make some nice money on this fairly small stock. So I'll pick again eGov and add some add another thousand dollars on eGov to the portfolio. Thanks, Ken. And and you actually did pick it back here, so you're in at a pretty good price point back at the middle of that chronicle. All right, let's switch gears and talk uh, big infrastructure company that has been one of Hugh's favorites for a while now. He has to probably unmute himself. Let me unmute people. myself. Yeah, there you go. Sorry, but... <laughs> <laughs> so yet again, again, this dog lover uh, who just actually bought a book on dogs from Amazon is going to pick Cat, Caterpillar, uh, a cyclical company, obviously, a large company, and a company that pays a, not a half bad dividend, but a company that has been struggling and probably will continue to struggle because its fortunes are tied to things like expansion in China, which has slowed down a little bit, what's going on in Australia, which is impacted by what's going on in China, and the oil industry, which um, has been suffering in the sense that there's not as much drilling for new sources of natural gas and, and oil, so I guess the energy industry to speak more broadly. So we skip along to the next slide, and I'm going to keep this short and sweet and go through the process that I adopt every week, every month when we do this, and certainly uh, weekly when I'm trying to buy things. I order things by how close they are to the bottom, from a 50-week low to the 50-week high, and the ladder on the next page just shows you that the closer it is to the bottom, the lower the percentage would be. So it's the difference between the high and the low price, uh, and then you look at the current price based on that range. Uh, sorry, the current price based on how close it is to the low. So if it's right at the low, you'll get zero. If it's in the middle, you'll get 50%. And if it's at the high, uh, you get 100%. The goal is actually just to protect downside. And it's one of the screening things that I would do before I apply the SSG or look at manifest investing to see if the thing is worth buying. And if we skip along to the next slide, there are a number of companies there, but the, the one that stands out to me could be Coca-Cola, even Air Environment, but I'd like to buy that even cheaper if I could, and I'm waiting for American Express to settle down after its little snip with um, Costco, but we'll see how that works its way along. But the one that I'm looking at right now, once again, is Caterpillar, which has recovered a little bit, but it's still fairly close to its 52-week low. And if we move along to the next slide, I just, um, you know, put the philosophy on there of what I'm doing. So if we look at the top of the list, those that are near their all-time high, you have Sigma Aldrich, which will be acquired in a matter of weeks. So it's very close to the acquisition price that was named by Merck Europe, not the Merck that we love, no one love, headquartered in New Jersey, but the, I guess it really is a parent company in Europe. The Merck in the U.S. got confiscated in World War I as did a lot of pharmaceutical companies that were German-owned. Uh, so they're two separate entities now. And there's a bunch of other companies that you can see that are close to their 52-week uh, high. In fact, Disney recently hit it. Uh, Microsoft's doing spectacularly well recently. Um, so a healthy list, but an expensive list, and the dividend yield is lower in these companies often as a result, as is the projected annual return. And I apologize I didn't get a lot of time to prepare this, but I got stuck in... San Diego today, longer than I expected, 
and just managed to reach here, I guess, 30 or 45 minutes before we started. So I had to scramble to do this. So Caterpillar is the uh, selection du jour. And if we move along to the next slide, it gives a synopsis, and this is a direct copy of what I showed last month. But the fact of the matter is that revenues are dragging a little bit uh, for the reasons I, I speculated on earlier. It's sitting on a boatload of cash. It is doing a share buyback program, and it has raised its dividend. Two very positive signs for investors, but the stock price is still low. That's good for people like me who like to buy things when they're low. So if we move on to the next slide. We take a quick gander at the stock selection guide, and it tells a, a story. Now, the bottom of this chart is cut off. And for those of you who are in the audience who may not be members of Better Investing, shame on you. But this is an approach for conservative investors who have a long-term time horizon to analyze a company and to figure out if, A, it's a quality company, and B, if the price is uh, appealing. And you can see here that the sales have been all over the place. It is, as I said, a cyclical company. Uh, and maybe there's early signs that things are starting to recover. Earnings certainly have improved slightly, but there's umpteen dozen reasons for doing that, for that happening, including a share buyback program, because if those shares are taken out of circulation and put into treasury stock, they don't become part of the calculation of earnings per share anymore. And if we skip along to the next slide, part two shows that weird things have been going on with the return in equity. And the reason for that, if you look at 2C, is that the company at some point took on a little bit more debt. Now, the fact of the matter is that Parts 2A, the pre-tax profit and sales, and Part 2B of the Stock Selection Guide should track each other. When one goes up, so should the other. When one goes down, so should the other. But if they don't, it's generally because the company, for whatever reason, usually an acquisition, has assumed more debt. And that occurred about three or four years ago, and that's when they started to get out of whack. And so it kind of maybe puts the five-year average, certainly, of the uh, return on equity into a little bit of question. It's down for a reason. But the pre-tax profit and sales, it's even, give or take. And that's to be expected, given the environment this company is in right now. This industry is in a recession, and Caterpillar, to some extent, might be leading the way. And part three of the stock selection guide is an analysis of how much you're paying for the company, how much is the price-earnings ratio, and it gives you an indication as to whether the company is trading at a high or a low. And because this company is cyclical, the PE ratio behaves a little bit differently. Generally, we shy away when it's a growth company from a high PE and are more attracted to a low PE. But it turns out that for a cyclical company, the opposite happens. A high PE usually signals a recovery because the earnings are depressed, but the price can be high. And conversely, when the company is going into bad times, the, the PE can actually be low. Excuse me, it can be the opposite, it can be high. So we, we, you need to, to remember that for a cyclical company, a high PE is often a positive thing, but you need to dig in to make sure, and a low PE uh, can actually be a negative thing because company is going into uh, a recession or a downturn. And skipping along, I've chosen what I think are fairly conservative estimates of the high and the low PE, 16 and 10, gives the anticipated high price of about 120 here, but the challenge is part 4, B, and then in parentheses D, selecting the low price, the estimated low price. That is kind of tough because if you just pull the price off that you get from the stock selection guide, you get a very high risk reward ratio, which you like, a high upside downside. But the problem is that this company is near its 52-week low. It also pays a pretty decent dividend, and the price to dividend support gives you a kind of a wacky number as well. So I, I toggled it down a bit to 75. I, you know, there's going to have to be a lot more bad news for it to get down that low. It hasn't been there recently, but it could happen. But with this conservative approach, I still don't get the proverbial three to one upside downside that people know and love. But I still believe that for the long haul, and the long haul for me is, uh, you know, the, the length that most people own a house, te decades rather than three to six days, like Roy's good friend on the TV, then um, I'm quite happy with this company. So we skip along to the very final page. Uh, it is a dog, uh, but not a lot has changed. It will continue to be a dog. It will continue to languish, I'm sure, for a while. But it is the, the, the leader of the pack. 
cat is the best dog that there is. Uh, it's, last year's performance, as I said last month, was, was, was okay, it wasn't great, and I think it's going to be tough this year too, but for a long-term investor like me, I like to accumulate things <clears throat> when they're in the doldrums in the hope that things will improve over time. It happens a lot of the time, and it doesn't have to happen all the time, but I hope it, happen, I hope it happens this time. And I will be adding uh, yet another dollop of Caterpillar to the portfolio. So I'll hand it back to, I think Reverend Sai is up next, is he? He is. Thanks. Thanks, you. So take it away, Preacher. All right. <laughs> He's probably Thank sneaking you. a peek at the Braves. And hey, Mark, ab absolutely have to have to keep keep an eye on them. Uh, although I think they need some heavenly intervention or something. Uh, Sai, if you'd give me a moment, I'm going to jump in here. I have a hand in the air from Jane, and Jane, you're unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay, Jane might have uh, pressed that button inadvertently, so I'm going to take her hand down. And uh, go ahead, Sai. Thank you. Oh, sure, no problem. Jane was just waving at us, so let's all wave back, back <laughs> at her. Um, tonight, uh, I, I'm uh, a little bit doing um, some of Hugh's uh, Caterpillar analysis, though not anywhere near the um, discount, uh, the, the uh, deep value or, or – um, uh, type of analysis that, that Hugh is, is doing, but, but I think uh, T. Rowe Price is a company uh, that may be somewhat undervalued now or underappreciated um, because they're, you know, we're, we're uh, in a very mature uh, bull market. We're uh, now six years into the bull. T. Rowe Price, uh, as a broker, as a financial company, uh, does tend to have um, cyclicality based on the stock market as well as the business cycle. Uh, you can't really see it. Well, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I was looking at uh, um, the, the uh, top line. You can see it some in the, uh, the bottom line, the, the blue line uh, on this chart. You see some dip uh, in the 2008, 2009. There's a little bit in the uh, the top green line as well. You just can't see it quite as, as dramatically. Uh, but still, notice over the full 10-year uh, period, 10-year plus period that we're looking at, 12 years actually, it is a very uh, up straight and parallel uh, company. So uh, I think that uh, T. Rowe Price could have some opportunity now because of, of concern over um, increased interest rates, the impact that could have on the stock market and on uh, brokers and money managers like uh, T. Rowe Price. Let's go ahead and look at the next slide, uh, Mark. Oh, I stuck this one in here so you could preach on PE ratios. There, all right. Uh, I, I'll pull out my sermon notes and we'll, we'll <laughs> preach uh, on it. Uh, actually, this slide, I have not seen uh, this exact slide. Mark and I had uh, talked a little bit about uh, P.E. ratios uh, being rather frothy, and I th think uh, I was going to do a, a little bit of quick discussion of it on, on perhaps the next slide, but uh, this is a ratio between uh, are you, um, you're, you're, compare, you're looking at um, P.E. appreciation potential here. You're dividing uh, the uh, actual by the forecast mark is that, or no? I've got that backwards. Yeah, probably dividing the. Yeah, what you're basically looking at here is the whole standard edition, and anything pre 2014 would be the actual average PEs. The 2014 and 2015s are kind of the forecasts, and if you if you look out to the 2018 2019 timeframe, uh, value line will basically come back to 18. So you know we're basically in a situation where uh, compression is expected by uh, agencies like Value Line. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I see. I was misreading your your um, your caption here on the slide and, and thinking of what you and I were talking about. So these are actually the the actual nominal PC, PE numbers, either actual or or forecast. And you can see, of course, what has happened, and not surprisingly, 
notice from 2002-2003 uh, up to the uh, bear market in 2007-2008. Uh, that started dipping, you had rising PEs, and of course PEs crashed uh, in the 2008-2009 time frame, and of course they have uh, been headed back up and are, are projected uh, up for the next couple of years with, within somewhat of a, of a downturn uh, anticipated by, by value line. And that's, that's very naturally what you would expect. Uh, in a, a market cycle. Of course, I'll just, as long as we're looking at this and talking about PE concerns, uh, while I don't get as concerned as many people might uh, about um, macro trends in the economy and the impacts on PE, I can't get them out of the back of my head and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if uh, ever this economy reverts to a more normal recovery mode, uh, whether we would find ourselves in an actual long-term trend of declining PEs and rising interest rates. But again, remember, interest rates are, are currently still just about as low as they can get. There, there's been a little bit of an uptick, and of course the market is, is day by day watching, trying to guess what the Fed's going to do, and watching the economic numbers. Um, you know, the latest betting now is that the Fed's going to leave interest rates for another um, five, six months or so because of the latest uh, GDP report coming out rather disappointing. Um, but at, at some point in time, the interest rates are going to start turning up and, and understand that P.E. ratios, and I'm talking about market wide PE ratios, not necessarily company PEs, uh, individual companies uh, move inversely with interest rates. Interest rates rise, PE ratios fall. And again, that's part of why over this full 2002 to 2015, 2016 shown on this chart, why you see such a strong uptrend in the PE ratios over time with, again, the recession and bear market uh, interrupting it, but this has been a time of falling interest rates. So just keep that in the back of your mind whenever you you wonder about what's going to happen with PEs or you think maybe companies are being a little frothy or uh, have a, a little bit of a frothy PE ratio um, and your gut's a little bothered, you, you may want to rely on your gut uh, a bit. And uh, of course, Hugh, um, I don't know. I haven't heard heard Hugh talk lately a whole lot about watching PE ratio specifically, but he's doing some of this, of course, with his 52-week uh, or uh, three to five-year lows that he talks about in companies. Because on a company basis, very frequently you're going to be buying at relatively low PEs for the company when they are selling at a 52-week low or a three or five-year low. Uh, next slide, Mark. Whoops, I think we went, and this is the uh, value line, <clears throat> uh, top of the value line page for T. Rowe Price. You do see a uh, value line is not extremely optimistic uh, over T. Rowe Price with a 2% uh, projected uh, low return. Um, but, but again, um, they're, they're looking at it uh, very much as a market performer uh, in the timeliness um, rating and of course gives it above average on on safety and I again I don't try and sec um, not second guess try to uh, get behind value lines thought process but uh, I I do tend to think when we're in solid market trends and and there's uncertain times which is where we are now. You, you've got a strong bull market and we're, we're moving uncertain. I, I find value line sometimes uh, you know, jumps on its own bandwagon and becomes uh, either overly optimistic or overly pessimistic. I think perhaps their, their PE ratios may be on the optimistic side with some situations and I think perhaps with the T. Rowe Price uh, situation they're a little bit unduly pessimistic uh, based on the concern over uh, a potential bear market and financial stocks. Yeah, and one I noticed, the... noticed there with, with T. Rowe Price, contrary to what I just said about P.E. projections, generally they're projecting a very low P.E. ratio for 
T. row Price. Yeah, and one of the things we like to point out, Sai, is, you know, the, a value line is one opinion. And in this case, they're kind of one loan opinion because um, they have a low return forecast, but Morningstar and Standard & Poor's, and for that matter, uh, the general analyst consensus is actually quite favorable for this company. That's that's why sometimes people wonder how can the manifest investing consensus be so different than the value line number? Well, there it is. I mean, everybody else is actually pretty bullish. They actually think this company is slightly on sale, and right. value line is the exception. Yes, very, very. Thank you for for pointing that that out, Mark. And you'll see when I get to my judgments, I'm actually uh, a little optimistic on the P/E ratio. Uh, for this particular company. Uh, here uh, is the slide that uh, partially where I got T. Rowe Price from. I, I really picked T. Rowe Price um, off the dashboard uh, just by ranking um, top to bottom uh, PARs and then looking for companies that had the quality uh, standards that I, I um, was looking for. Um, kind of uh, thinking along the lines of what Ken said earlier uh, about looking perhaps outside the technology uh, area, but for something else that did have some uh, contrarian potential, uh, read that to mean financial stocks, um, and uh, not to get uh, um, kidded again by Mark for picking Cognizant, uh, which certainly would have been an easy pick to have made this month. Uh, I decided on T. Rowe Price. But if you look at this particular uh, chart, these, uh, this is the um, sweet spot screen that comes up whenever you just click on uh, research companies uh, at manifestinvesting.com. It's the pre-selected uh, high quality uh, companies in, in the uh, sweet spot. You see T. Rowe Price is relatively high ranked uh, among these companies. If you just run down um, the P.E. ratios there with concern over P.E. PE ratios being high, you will notice that on this particular screen, T. Rowe Price, I believe, has the lowest P.E. Actually, out of all of the sweet spot screen companies, I believe uh, T. Rowe is about the fourth lowest, uh, but it's the lowest of these, the higher par uh, ones shown on this screen. Uh, and what I also do, I... I don't spend a lot of time comparing current PEs with uh, forecast PEs, uh, otherwise known as relative value. But again, when I'm concerned that PEs are maybe a little high, I do. Uh, basically, what I do, I take a look at the PAR column, that being the far right-hand column, and compare it to the far left-hand column which is the growth column. Now, recognize that that is sales growth, not necessarily earnings growth. So you can have something going on uh, in there, uh, like Hugh was talking about with share buybacks or, or something uh, of, of that sort. But uh, essentially, if your PAR is higher than the growth rate, that's probably indicating at least a little bit of PE uh, expansion. It, and if it's the other way around, uh, that being the uh, PAR is lower than the growth rate, uh, then it would be some uh, PE contraction. So it's just kind of a quick, if I say, gee, the, the PE is a little high uh, looking, let's say, for example, uh, look at Chipotle projecting a 42 PE uh, with a 13% par and a 14% growth rate, that's telling me that the current PE is probably above 42. Uh, so, so I would certainly be thinking that company's a, a bit uh, on the pricey uh, side. The other thing that caught my eye on this particular slide that drew my attention to T. Rowe Price is that yield of the 2.4%. Again, in this market environment with potential rising interest rates, I think yield Will, will help provide some downside risk support uh, for companies. Uh, so that's, that's where uh, T. Rowe Price uh, came from. Next slide, Mark. And these are my judgments, and I've uh, just put in um, the consensus judgments along this. As Mark mentioned earlier, T. Rowe Price is one of the financial companies that um, Manifest uses the book value and the return on equity to calculate earnings per share. 
Uh, my raw numbers actually came from a more traditional stock selection guide uh, based on revenues, but uh, they, they convert very easily and my judgments tend to track um, uh, manifest consensus numbers. You see uh, the growth, uh, I projected a little bit lower uh, than consensus is. Profitability also just a smidgen lower. I left profitability about where it is and uh, the consensus is that it will expand a little bit, but from 21 to 22 is not a, uh, a significant uh, difference. Uh, PE is where uh, we vary a little bit uh, based on uh, median PEs for the last 10 years, which I thought was a pretty good um, representation of potential PEs for T. row price, given um, the, the market cycles that we've had over the last 10 years and the steadiness of T. row price's growth, I thought was was a, a reasonable um, base uh, basis for my futures. I came up with a little bit higher PE ratio uh, than the consensus, but that just offsets um, the lower growth rates because you see down at the bottom we end up with almost identical uh, projected average returns. So uh, I'm suggesting that uh, we add some T. row price this month. Okay. Thanks, I will go ahead and do that. A little bit of a contrarian pick there. All right, I'm showing 931. I'll try to wrap us up here in 10 minutes or so. Thought I'd share a little bit about our dirty dozen. I've started putting this uh, together towards the beginning of the week when we're in the middle of the, the batch update. We basically take a look at all the, the value line companies in the weekly updates. And what I've wanted to do for a while is to expand uh, the scope of the stuff that we kick out to include not just the standard edition companies and to, to basically use some external triggers or nudges. Uh, to help us do this. And what I'm focusing in here on, on this particular slide is something quite simple. It's just what is the the one-year outlook according to the analyst consensus. Now, I'm not saying they're right, but I'm saying, you know, what are some of the best-looking companies with respect to the analyst consensus outlook that would be price appreciation plus dividends over the next year or so? And collecting up the top dozen or so based on some a fairly simple screening criteria. Want companies that are above average quality, so a quality ranking above 50. Now, some of those are going to be a little bit dicey down in the 50s, but we'll just for now we'll just settle for quality rating above 50, so that they're above average. And then we wanted to rank the highest one-year analyst consensus outlook from top to bottom. And so that's what you see here. The first thing you might want to notice is that all of them are in yellow. Um, a little dicey. I mean, I would can. I would uh, compare kind of what we're doing here to the undervalued feature in Better Investing Magazine. Sometimes we had a hard time wrapping our arms around exactly what was the stock to study and what were the characteristics or our expectations from the undervalued stock. And a lot of times our thinking on the undervalued stock was to try to, try to frame a company that had a relatively short one or two year catalyst or something that, you know, perhaps a temporarily depressed stock price or some actual real market catalyst that might deliver an outsized return over the next one to two years. Again, a relatively short amount of time in our world, uh, an infinitely long amount of time for the young man that was on CNBC with Roy today. Um, so we, we do our, we're still thinking, you know, five, 10, 15 year time horizons, but Again, looking for that kind of short-term catalyst. So again, from left to right, you see just the standard uh, presentation of different opinions. Not a whole lot of opinions from Morningstar and Standard & Poor's. Actually, almost none from Goldman Sachs. That's what GS stands for. Um, but the, the company that kind of jumped off the page was the company that was the, the number one ranked uh, per potential opportunity in this week's update in the Standard Edition, Iconics Brand Group. Iconics brand, ticker symbol ICON. I'm just going to go ahead and go with that one. You see it has a decent return, a good quality rating. It ranks in the top 4% of all companies based on the combination of these two characteristics. Um, again, a little bit dicey, but a decent return forecast. That's, that's the low total return forecast according to Value Line. Uh, Standard & Poor's sees it as being on sale, basically 28% below the fair value. 
and again, highest uh, outlook over the next year or so. Now, if you go in and you just grab ACE numbers off of Finance Yahoo, um, you'll see some differences. And we actually do take a look at the staleness of some of the numbers. We give more weight to um, analyst consensus price targets that are less than uh, three months old, in other words, fresh within the current quarter. But all of that's been conditioned to try to present this list. There's some pretty interesting companies on this list, you know, Mastec, Balcam, a couple others down the way, HMS Holdings that we featured around Christmas time a few years ago, some good stuff. Here's a look at the company, the thumbnail for the company. And again, fairly up straight and parallel. This is a company that I've always wanted to take a closer look at, but never have. Never seemed to quite find the time. Pretty decent picture on that top line. Again, we're looking at a situation there of, you know, 8 to 10% top line growth with maybe something a little bit less than that, high single digits uh, for the, the last five or six years and going forward. That's Those are numbers with a company like this that we can live with. A little bit of price volatility through the Great Recession that you can see in the price bars. And considering the business that they're in, which is retail, um, pretty decent picture on that bottom line at the bottom of the chart. The one major difference that you're going to see me hone in on is as I study the company, um, this is a company that I would not give a, a standard market PE to. Um, consensus is somewhere in the mid to low teens. I'd, I would probably come in down around 11, and that's the major difference between the analyst consensus forecast and my own personal study, which would be, again, down in the low teens. Still a, a robust number compared, when you think about the average stock being down in that 5 to 6% range, that's not, not a bad number. A couple other looks at the company, and we're going to talk a little bit about a bit of a hornet's nest that the company is in. Um, P ratio, yeah, it's going to cycle around with the general economy. It's going to be a bit cyclical, but again, settling in somewhere in that low double-digit range. Uh, the net margin profitability characteristic that you see there is really a function of, you know, maturing uh, product portfolio, uh, the brand portfolio that they have, and uh, not the end of the world, but... Uh, it, it is tapering off and maturing a little bit. That's something that they have to watch very carefully as they as they maintain their portfolio. We'll talk exactly about what they do here in a minute. Here's a look at the Chronicle. Again, much like Ken said a few minutes ago, I really like to find companies that have uh, upward characteristic and quality, either maintaining fairly steady quality or showing a trend of improvement. And uh, Iconix certainly fits that. Um, with respect to the return forecast, the projected annual return really looked quite good back here um, about four years ago with the stock price down in the, in the low teen, mid to low teens, and it, it actually took off and has done quite well. Well, that projected return, that return forecast is back, and some of that's driven by some current uh, turbulence. There's a real disturbance in the force at this company, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But the return forecast is back at a, a fairly high level and a real nice quality picture for this company. Here's just a, a, a more detailed look at the, the price chart for this company. Again, really to take a look at what happens to this company in a recession. You can certainly see that here. Took a pretty good hit, pretty decent recovery. Um, real strong run coming out of 2012 up to that peak. And... The recent disturbance in the force has been quite significant. It's, it's dropped down from 45 to the high 20s here in the last couple of months. And uh, they faced some challenges and actually had resignation of a couple of executives here within the last month. So that, again, is something that could uh, potentially make our skin crawl as investors, certainly something we want to be aware of. But uh, that is what's going on. Here's a look at the company. I, I was kind of stunned. This is uh, quite a formidable company. They represent $13 billion in global retail sales uh, from companies like Candies to, uh, you can see they just acquired the Peanuts franchise down on the lower right. That's a sharper image there. You'll see other names that you recognize like London Fog, Danskin, Joe Boxer, Starter. They have the Umbro brand for soccer equipment that hasn't taken off so much in the States, but very popular internationally. They have high, high expectations for what that might do in the Far East. But a number of companies, uh, 
that many of you probably recognize. I certainly dialed in on London Fog, but th this is what they actually represent. They represent these very uh, common brands. Here's what they do. Uh, your traditional company has all the functions on the left-hand side of that. What Iconix does is they just take a piece of that and do it. They, it's been compared to kind of like a real estate landlord situation where they, these brands could be thought of as properties that they own and rent out. The royalties and license fees that they get are kind of like rent. So anything that you might think of a landlord wanting to do, like uh, keeping visibility up, really um, you know, keeping public relations in place, all that kind of stuff, merchandising and marketing and advertising and PR, uh, that's what they do, and they do on behalf of these companies. And it's really kind of almost like a sports agent situation where they can uh, – they can really take advantage of some uh, common threads and networking and all that kind of stuff. And then everything below the line, everything below this light blue box, is the individual brand or franchise responsibility. So literally, they have all the challenges and mysteries of the inventory, um, manpower, you know, facilities management, all that stuff is kind of up to the individual brands. I'm sure Iconics has some opinions. But they're out there just doing the promotion and marketing side of stuff. And for doing that, it actually works out to be about anything that you might pay for. So say you bought one of those products from one of the brands in Costco. Um, it ends up being between 3 to 4% of your purchase price is actually going to end up in Iconix's hands, if you want to think of it that way. So anytime you buy one of those products we saw on that slide. Um, the company is very global, 40% coming from international. A pretty decent product distribution in the portfolio. There's uh, the dominant one there is women's fashion, which again gives most of us kind of the heebie-jeebies. Uh, women's fashion can be quite uh, uh, vulnerable to fads and that kind of stuff, and can be quite turbulent. But they have only 30% in that, and they're represented across a number of different things: entertainment, sports, men's fashion, and uh, just look at the the vast spectrum in that pyramid of. Uh, the companies where their their products, the retailers that they work with, to uh, get these products and services sold, and uh, pretty hard pressed not to find one that we haven't spent some time in, from top to bottom there. Pretty impressive, and uh, I was actually kind of a little stunned that I didn't have a little more familiarity with, you know, what these guys did. Good stuff. So here's a look at the return forecast, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the turbulence going on at the company. Again, everything is pretty much the same with respect to the, the value line, which came out this week, which has an elevated return forecast. Um, quite, quite, quite good. Um, but as you study the company, based on those pictures we, we showed back a few minutes ago, I would, uh, I would come in with a slightly lower PE, but I, I would be okay with the growth rate checking in at you know high single digits and decent upper 20s net margins. Um, as an owner, I would watch very carefully for margin erosion, erosion of expectations, but uh, I'd be okay with these. The lower PE, and it still leaves us again in that very nice position of uh, a 13.8, you know, call it 14 or 15% return forecast. Um, which is pretty good considering that the average stock is down in the 5 to 6% range. Some pretty good stuff there. So as, as a reminder, um, I mean, top and bottom line look pretty good. That's pretty close to up straight and parallel for a, a retailer. No signs of dramatic turbulence in the actual operating results, and that's what's, that's what's so important because with a company like Iconix, they've come under fire. Um, the two executives that resigned within the last month were the chief financial officer and the chief operating officer. And I, I listened to my first conference call in probably three or four years this morning to hear this company's executives talk about this. And uh, their answer to this question, and it, it actually came across pretty good to me. First of all, both of the gentlemen involved had only been with the company about a year. They didn't even have a chief operating officer before. The responsibilities of the chief, chief operating officer are being assumed by other members of the management team, so they're not even going to replace the COO. They are going to replace the CFO. Again, it's, it's not a case of you know, the, uh, a 20 or 30-year chief financial officer suddenly walking off the job. Uh, that's not what's going on here. There could be stuff going on. There, there could be uh, nasty stuff going on. In our uh, 
in our forum, I did include a couple of links to some of the short seller um, bashing of the company just to get the, the full picture there, questioning some of the revenue recognition and that kind of stuff as a, a good short selling uh, contributor would do. But uh, they do do some complex tra transactions with their joint ventures and that kind of stuff. And sometimes the tax laws and, and the accounting principles can get kind of, kind of, kind of hairy. And uh, there is, there probably is an opportunity for, for things to be uh, a little bit off kilter, but, uh, again, these guys have been at this for a while, and they seem to be quite good at it. Operating results weak coming in this quarter, but long-term looks pretty good. Um, just an overall pretty decent picture as, as far as I'm concerned. So with that, I'm going to say uh, we'll add Iconics to the portfolio. One of the things that I will do as a stipulation is, much like we did a few m months ago with uh, Chicago Bridge and Iron, probably will put the same type of uh, limit, uh, protective limit on this company because, uh, again, we're dealing with retail here. And who knows, there, there could be more to this story. So with that, Ken, if you're ready to go, we can probably go ahead and try out a poll. Okay, I'm going to launch our poll uh, and ask the audience to uh, tell us which of the four stocks we presented this evening uh, do they think uh, they would like to add to the portfolio, or they can also vote for none of the above. So the poll is open. Uh, you can use your mouse to uh, make a choice. You just go up there and click. Uh, we're already up to half of our audience voting. Let's try to get up to around 85, 90% voting if we can. That's taken us to three quarters of the audience voting. Uh, it's real easy, folks. Just go up there and click on the, the item that you think should uh, receive the vote. Uh, I'm going to give us five more seconds. I'm always and impressed I'm with all people to, they make up their minds. And I'm going to close the poll, and I'm going to share the results. And it looks like they're going to add eGov, uh, uh, a second holding of eGov to the portfolio. Uh, they also liked size T. Rowe Price. Uh, a few folks didn't like any of them. So let me. I, I didn't finish in last place, did I? Yeah. No, you didn't, Mark. You, you uh, <laughs> did not come in last. This... And, and, and and I will note that the very first vote was for T. Rowe Price. So uh, you know, <laughs> it was ice and people. So. So Bar Barbara's logged in, logged in in the living room, or? I guess so. I guess so. Somebody had a real fast trigger figure there, huh, Si? Yes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hide yeah, I the call poll. I covered this, please. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, as you know, Si, the, the last shall be first. There you go. You got it. I think okay. you read that somewhere. Uh, we do have a question here from Marie. She wanted to know, uh, did I consider Maximus that I uh, presented a couple of uh, months ago, did I consider that a competitor to eGov? Uh, Yahoo does consider the two companies competitors. Uh, the research that I did, Marie, shows that Maximus and eGov uh, do both uh, – uh, control systems for various governments. Uh, Maximus, however, is more into controlling uh, uh, child welfare systems, for example, or or uh, uh, food stamp programs, or different programs that that the state uh, uses to check on people. Uh, there does appear uh, to be a little bit of overlap in a couple of the states where both companies operate, but for the most part, right now at least, they're independent of each other, even though they both have pretty much the same business model. I would imagine if you talk to the CEOs of both companies, uh, they'd both like to eventually do everything the other company is doing. Uh, so I, I, I certainly think that there's the potential there for them to become competitors in the future. But right now, I don't think that there uh, any there's any major competition going on between the two companies. 
Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, Cy, uh, Anne would like, not Cy, Hugh. Anne would like to know uh, what level of debt uh, would you consider to be too much for a company like Caterpillar? You know, I have never had a magic percentage when it comes to debt because it's really industry debt driven. You would expect a software company to have almost none. You would have expected an airline to have a lot. And certainly over the, the 20 percent, which most people seem to adopt as a trigger point for being concerned. The fact of the matter is that a leader in a field, when you look at the debt to equity ratio, which is a good one to look at, generally um, finances most of its operations on equity rather than debt. So what I really look for is who's competing with Caterpillar. I look at the percent of the debt that they hold as to compare to their total capital. And uh, if that number is lower than its competitors, as it should be, it's yet another indication it's a leader. Leaders generally have higher PEs. They have slightly higher profitability than their competitors. Overall, they grow faster, better ROE, and slightly lower debt. But I'm not, con I'm not worried at a number uh, like 56%. I would be worried if every other company had like 15 or 10%. That would be a huge concern. Right. Yeah. And, and and also notice, I'm, I'm not Hugh, but notice in the uh, capital structure block that Mark just called up, and I believe Ann mentioned even in her uh, question, uh, $25 billion of the $27 billion in long-term debt is uh, Caterpillar Financial. Mm -hmm. which of course, remember, financial companies actually make money on debt. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Susan would like to know, our friend Susan, one of our damsels from Wisconsin, uh, would like to know, Mark, where did you find the ACE numbers on your chart? Okay, uh, for, for any company, if you go to Finance Yahoo, and we'll go into, uh, well, let's go ahead and look at Icon. So for for Icon Iconics brand, the current price is twenty six thirty one. The one year target estimate is thirty nine. So you're looking at the difference between twenty six thirty one and thirty nine, and we look at that for all twenty four hundred companies. Um, we will condition that number. Like I was saying, one of the things that I will look at is we use the analyst network ratings network. And for a company like Icon, I'm not even sure what this one looks like. You can actually see how current these are. So we would pay much more attention to uh, price targets that have been selected within the last, you know, few weeks than going back. Sometimes you'll jump on here and you'll see 2013. <laughs> um, so, you know, that one obviously doesn't get quite as much weight or emphasis. But in this case, most of the companies in the, are looking for, you know, a one-year price target in the upper 30s. And then I'll, we'll come back and actually compare that to the Yahoo Finance number. And Mark, can you, can you real quickly show us how you got to that page again that you were just on? Uh, the, the Analyst Resource Network? Yeah. It's, yes. It's actually analystratings.net. AnalystRatings.net. And then uh, there are some questions, Mark. How did how do you read that column that you were um, that you were showing us? Some of the numbers were had two numbers in. How did you read that uh, column then? Talking about the dirty dozen on the, on the analyst rating uh, site. Oh, on that actual site. Okay. Well, what they're showing you here is, for example, uh, on March 6th for, in this case, the fresh market, BMO Capital Markets raised their target from 44 to 49. Okay. So let me. So the the arrow uh, talks about going from there to the next number. Then, right. okay. And let me let me right. show, let me show you one that will have some meaning to this group. All right, while you're doing that, I'm going to unmute Susan because her question, uh, this, her question generated this discussion, and she evidently wants to follow up. Uh, Susan, you're on. Let me get you unmuted uh, here real quickly, if I can. 
I just lost your name. <laughs> Hold on, Susan. Michalik. Yep. There we go, Susan. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Hey, Susan. Uh, Mark, hi. I understand what you did on that front page, but if you go down the left-hand side of that Yahoo site and you look at analyst estimates, there they have for this year uh, a growth rate of 10.4 percent. So I don't. I, I don't know if you can explain what the difference would be or right. I'm just operating. I, I, I presume I presume these are ACE numbers too, but I don't know. Right. I'm just dealing on price only. Okay. So in the, I see. Okay. So this is okay. Got it. In the case of let's look at Icon here. I'm not dealing in any of the the growth forecasts or any of that kind of stuff. Wow. Getting some kind of a system warning on Yahoo. That's weird. Thank you. That's where my confusion was. I thought yeah, it was. It's just, it's just a little, you look, we're looking at a situation where the current stock price is 26, and the, the average analyst out there on the street is expecting it to be, you know, 35, 36, 38, and that consensus number was uh, right around 39, I believe. Okay. Those are really current numbers. The one that I wanted to show, um, my screen seems to have locked up here, is Helmerich and Payne. Um, Helmerich and Payne, ticker symbol HP, they're in the oil and gas field equipment stuff. Um, yeah, something's going on with my plug-in. Um, Goldman Sachs just raised their price target from 51 to 85. Huh. Wow. So they're, they're basically signaling with that. They think that uh, there's going to be a turnaround in oil and gas field services probably sooner than most of the other analyst firms. And, again, I don't know whether they're right or not. I just think it's kind of interesting to be aware of it. Um, you, you'll see us on the Dirty Dozen. You'll see us following the Goldman Sachs stuff closer. One of the reasons that we do that, first of all, I don't want to follow them all. Second of all, Goldman Sachs is probably the most influential. Goldman Sachs comes up with a big price target upgrade yeah. uh, in the morning. Typically, that stock's going to go up five or six percent that day, and uh, that's the reason their, their their power and influence is what's triggering that. And we're just going to watch them to see what we can learn from that. We're not trying to be traders, but in you know the Helmerich and Payne thing is a pretty good example of if that's if that's got any merit to it, uh, that could have some uh, investment opportunity implications. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mark, I'm following the question box here, and it appears that uh, we've cleared the question box pretty nicely. I don't see any hands in the air. Uh, I'm going to give people, usually when I say that, uh, about <laughs> eight seconds later, things appear. So we'll give people about eight or nine seconds here, but if I don't see anything appearing, uh, I'd like to thank everybody once again for a, a really interesting session.